me pray for us one more time. Father, we know that our security is in you. We know that Jesus is the center of everything. And man lives not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. And that means that you decide when we live and when we come home. And so we are grateful to know that we are completely in your hands. And yet you ask us to take the precautions and do the things we need to do as human beings. So we are thankful for those who see those needs and serve us in that way. Mostly, God, we're thankful today to, that you bring us together to know you better, to worship you together. I pray that our time together, as we, as we focus on your word, would, would open our hearts and minds up to what you want to say to us. God, I pray that the message that you've given me would come through me, not with my words and not with any of my wisdom, but with yours, and that you would speak to each of us right where we need. Holy Spirit, we invite you to move in our hearts and minds right now to illuminate your word to our minds and to make us different people because we were here today. In Jesus' name, amen. So in 1998, Spencer Johnson wrote what has become a, a, a classic business text. Now in this text, he masterfully wove a fable that involves four characters who live in a maze. Two little mice named uh, Scurry and Sniff, and two little people named Hem and Haw. Say hello for me. The lives of all four characters revolve around their main source of food, the thing they love the most cheese. Him and Haw were so enamored with cheese, they moved their houses closer so they could be right there. They built their lives around cheese. Unfortunately, they were so engrossed with the cheese that they had that they didn't notice that the cheese supply was dwindling. One morning, they went out and they went over to get their cheese and the cheese was all gone. Somebody moved their cheese. Now this was no problem for the two little mice, Scurry and Sniff. They had already scurried off and they were sniffing out a new source of cheese. And it wasn't long before they were munching on aromatic, delicious, wonderful cheese. Hem and Haw were much slower to act. Someone had stolen their cheese. Someone had done them wrong. They owned that cheese. That was their cheese, and nobody should be able to touch it. But somebody had the audacity to steal their cheese. Their cheese had been moved. And they were going to wait there until that somebody brought their cheese back. Johnson's fable touches on something that we all experience. Change. But as is the case in a make-believe world, Johnson doesn't get anywhere close to the pain, frustration, and angst that change brings into our real world. In our real world, we experience change brought, brought about through relational blow-ups, financial meltdowns, shattered dreams, divorce, job loss, bankruptcy, the pain of never really reaching our fullest potential, the devastation when people we trust fail us, or worse, betray us. We experience injustice, hatred, the loss of loved ones, injury inflicted on us through no fault of our own. In the real world, change comes at us from every angle, in every shape, and every size. Our cheese is continually moved. Now, cheese is whatever we value in this world. Anything we put our hope in, anything we put our trust in, that is our cheese. That is the thing that, that is continually, always being diminished, it is always changing, and it is always being moved. Turning your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21. 
And we will see that the disciples and the entire nation of Israel are about to go through a cosmic change, a cosmic shift. As Jesus, their promised king, comes into Jerusalem, they're all excited, everything is wonderful, and they can't wait, except when King Jesus gets there, things are not like they expected. Jesus himself moves their cheese. We'll start in verse 1. It's page 690 if you're using one of the pew Bibles. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. The excitement was palpable. He was their promised king in the line of David. This was the guy who was going to come and change everything. He rode into David's capital city, which would be his capital city, on a donkey, on a colt of a donkey, just as Zechariah the prophet in Zechariah 9.9 had prophesied would happen. The disciples were amazed. I mean, think about this. I've, I've looked into the history and I cannot find out what the answer to this question is. How did this person know to prepare the donkey and the colt and put them out by their house? How did they know? We have no idea, but the disciples, all they knew was what Jesus said. He said, you go, you'll find it, he'll say something to you, you say this to him and bring him back. Well, it was almost like that was the secret code that this guy was waiting for. Because the word was spread around a little bit, it seems like. Maybe not. We'll see in a moment. Everything worked out to the very detail. The disciples were completely amazed. The crowds were beside themselves with excitement. When they lay their cloaks and the branches down on the road, that was them rolling out the red carpet. They were saying, here is our king. We honor him. We are excited for him to ascend to the throne, for him to be the king that we have always longed for. But don't miss this. Don't miss this. The ones who were cheering and laying down their cloaks and the branches were not residents of the king's city. They were not residents of Jerusalem. They were the people that Jesus and his disciples had been gathering with him as they began this journey from Bethphage. That's where they came from. You know how I know that? We're going to look at verse 10 again. Verse 10. Who, and when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? The city didn't know who he was. I mean, something's not quite right. When the promised king of Israel comes to the capital city of Israel and the people who live there don't recognize him. The starting of a pattern. Worse yet, the religious leaders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, the ones who should have been cheering and rolling out the red carpet for their new king, were upset. 
they were red faced vein in the neck forehead bulging angry so they defied and rejected their king look at verse 14 and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them but when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple Hosanna to the son of David they were indignant to be indignant means to feel like you have been wronged and you are righteous to be angry so they're indignant feeling like the son of God wronged them and they are righteously indignant at him think of the irony of that they were indignant and they said to him do you hear what these are saying and Jesus said to them yes have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise they wanted him to stop the people they wanted him to silence the children because they were saying something that these people thought was wrong and Jesus still trying to correct them and help them see now don't think that the reason they got so angry was because of what the children and the and the other folks in the crowd were crying out to Jesus I think it started a little bit sooner I think it started when Jesus threatened their cheese look at verse 12 Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought of the temple. He overturned the, te the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. He called into, the qu into question their sacrifice for pay scheme. What they would do is people would travel from all over Israel to come and make sacrifice and as they did they they would have spent a year and they would have prepared the lamb for sacrifice they would have made sure it was perfect without blemish they'd have chosen the perfect one it had been nice and fat it would have been had no spot no problem no deficiency they would bring it to the temple area to the court of the Gentiles where all the world was supposed to gather and learn about God they turned this into their marketplace And the priest would almost invariably, almost every time, say, no, that's, that's not good. There's a blemish there. They would take their lamb, walk it around to the back, and they would make them buy another. I wonder how many times it was the very lamb they walked around to the back they made them buy. You've turned it into a den of robbers. Jesus threatened their cheese. And so they were angry. In their minds, this just proved to them that Jesus was not their king. They had it all figured out. Their Messiah was going to come. He was going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem where, from which he would rule the entire world with them at his side. But Jesus, when he comes to town, he challenges the things we hold most dear and things rarely go as we expect so Israel in my mind kind of stripped the gear as they they move from joy and and shouting Messiah is here to the bone jarring shock as they realize that Jesus their Messiah is there to confront and to judge but he's not there to confront and judge Rome he's there to confront and judge them it's no wonder that instead of King Jesus being welcomed with great fanfare gifts long-winded speeches and a feast in his honor that all he hears is crickets verse 17 reads this way and leaving them he went out of the city to Bethphage and lodged there that was the end of the triumphal entry he left no fanfare 
No gifts, no party, no coronation, because they had rejected him. The world they were groomed all their lives, expecting for it to be a certain way, evaporated before their very eyes as Jesus moved their cheese. Change is going to happen. God will move your cheese. We can ignore change, even fight against it. But we'll have about as much success as if we're trying to hold back the ocean with a pitchfork. You see, today's not about them. Today's about us. They're the backdrop against which God has something to say to us about who is king in our lives. When Jesus made his triumphal entry, we would all think that everybody would welcome him, and they well should have. But what about us? What, what is our response to King Jesus? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to respond? How can we get prepared for God, for our King, to move our cheese? I think there's three things that I see in this passage. First of all, accept Him as your King. He is King. No matter your situation, no matter how things turn out, He is the King and I am His subject. He decides what will happen and He owes me no explanation. And when He is my King, it's His cheese. Any of those things that I value, they belong to to him. See, when the king calls, there's only two responses you can have. You can either respond, yes, sir, and, and do what your king says, or you can deny, defy, and reject him. The disciples chose the former. They decided that they would follow after him. In a, in a rather difficult to hear teaching, Jesus turns to his disciples and he sees the crowd evaporate. He sees hundreds of people leave. He turns to the twelve. And he says, will you leave as well? Always quick with a response, Peter says this. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. We have believed and come to know. Right there is, is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in the beginning of that process. See, around here we believe that, that God wants us to be a force for good in golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. And a disciple is someone who connects with God. We believe. And someone who loves Jesus with everything they have. And we've come to know. They've come to know Him more deeply. And from that stage of discipleship, we move over to, to uh, grow in our spiritual maturity to become more like what Jesus wants us to be so that we're then able to engage our culture and make a difference in this world. The disciples were well on that path, but listen to how he, he finishes it off. You have the words of eternal life. We've believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. What's he saying? Jesus, we're not going anywhere. You are our king and our place is by your side even if what you do doesn't make sense. Even if what you say confuses us. Jesus, you're in charge of our cheese. But the people in Jerusalem, the city of, the, of David the city of Jesus, led by the religious leader, have a, had a different reaction, a different response. Because Jesus called their sacrifice for pay scheme into question, because he didn't stop the children and the others from crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is, is David's king, because he didn't stop all that. That was their public reason, his public cover-up, to turn away from him to reject him, to defy him, to say, no, this is not our king. And hear this. Though Jesus 
is sovereign king over all creation, including every child, woman, and man. He will not make anyone bow their knee to him. Now you must know this. In Philippians 3 it says, Every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But right now, while there's breath in our bodies... Jesus gives us the opportunity to choose to bow our knees to Him. To choose to put Him on the throne of our lives and not cheese. Because He will not force it. Those religious leaders rejected His reign and rule in their lives and it broke Jesus' heart. See, here's one of the ways that he is so much different than me. And what's your response when somebody somebody rejects you? You offer them something really nice and, and you do something really great for them and they just throw it away. They reject it. Jesus says this of Israel. This is back in Matthew 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He tells them, just like it is, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. So he knows he's not in good stead. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. You were not willing. But as I said earlier, today is not about them. Somebody once said, it's the wise person that learns from their mistakes. It's the wisest person who learns from the mistakes of others. Will we learn from the mistakes of others? Will we decide we're not going to reject Jesus as king, but to enthrone him in our lives and allow him to rule and reign over every area of our lives so that the passage that God inspired Isaiah to speak to the people of Israel does not come true of us. Isaiah 30, 15 says, This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And listen to these terrible words, but you would have none of them. Repent. Turn from life on your own. Stop pursuing cheese that will never fill you and will always be mobile. Always diminishing. And rest in Jesus' love. Once we recognize that Jesus is our king, accept him as our king, the next step should be something of a no-brainer. However, it's the problem that many of us who profess to be followers of King Jesus fall short in. But it's an accurate indicator of the value you place in your cheese. Recognize Jesus as your king, then live as a subject of your king. Live the kind of life that reflects that you are under the authority, that you are in allegiance that you are aligned with Jesus as your king. What does it mean to live as a subject of your king? Well, Tony Evans wrote a book called King Disciples, Heaven's Representatives on Earth, and I like the way he summarized the role of of a subject of King Jesus. It is, our role is to advance the visible manifestation of God's comprehensive rule over every area of our life. To visibly advance to manifest of God's comprehensive rule over every area of my life. That's what it means when I'm functioning as a subject of his kingdom. He owns it all. He has it all. Every single thing. To live as a subject of King Jesus means my life is different because the kingdom in which I live is different. The king 
that I follow is different. Money is not my king. Power is not my king. Sex is not my king. Sports are not my king. Recreation is not my king. Anything other than Jesus that we choose as king is merely cheese that will run out, can be taken from us, and most certainly will be moved more than once. When Jesus is my king, I pursue him, not cheese. Only Jesus is worth the throne of my life. Only Jesus is worthy to be followed. And when Jesus is king, there is nothing that he does not own. Everything in your life, everything in my life, everything in our church community is his to take, to use, to spend, to invest, to give away. So when our daily prayer is, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What I'm actually praying is a prayer that offers myself along with my cheese to him. So I'm actually praying your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Every step I take, every breath I take, every thought I have. Now, none of us is perfect. So to think that that's going to happen overnight or even probably before we die, where he has every access to everything, every thought and all that is probably a little naive. But if we don't have that as our target, we're going to miss the mark. Now that mark is not salvation. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're already His. That mark is obedience. And that mark is showing our love for Him. I want to be like you, Jesus, because I love you. That's what He's trying to help us understand that He wants more than anything for us. Because He is my King, He is in charge of my cheese. He can even come to your house and say like he did in the first three verses here, I want that special donkey you've been setting aside for someone else. I want to use that. He can come to our homes, he can come into our lives, and he can say, I want that. See, that's where we don't like it. We've got this stash of cheese. We worked for this. We earned this. Nobody gets to take it. Deuteronomy 8 9 says, after he's been talking to the people of Israel for a while, telling Moses, been, uh, God has been talking to them through Moses, and he, and he says to them, I'm going to bring you to this land. It's going to have land flowing with milk and honey. It's going to be super abundant. It's going to be great. You're going to have everything you'd ever need. But. When you get into that land and you settle in and you've got your houses and you've got your lands and you've got everything you ever needed, remember that it is the Lord your God who gives you the ability to create wealth. One of the greatest tests in our lives is affluence, prosperity. Because then we don't need God anymore. We've got money. We've got influence. We've got power. We've got our cheese. And we completely miss what our king tells us. Recognize him as king. Live as subject of King Jesus, but count the cost. If you have not chosen to put Jesus on the throne of your life yet, count the cost. Because if you choose to do this, or if you have, and you've just kind of been playing fast and loose through your life, and God is kind of speaking to you and, and pointing out an area or two that he wants control, he's walking up to your house saying, I want that donkey. I want that thing. 
Count the cost. Because living as a subject of the king puts you at odds with the enemy of everyone's soul, Satan. The third thing we need to do to prepare ourselves for him to move our cheese is to realize that you and I are a target. When we live as a subject of the king, we are a target. The April 4th um, uh, daily devotional, Our, Our Daily Bread, was entitled, Watch Out. And it began with these sobering words from 1 Peter 5. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. The enemies, the, ma- the majority of the enemy's attacks come from the shadows. He pulls strings, but we don't recognize it. He speaks, but we don't, we don't recognize his voice. As subjects of, his king, of, of Jesus' kingdom, be aware that in every situation we find ourselves, there are always two opposing forces that have a vested interest in what's going on. There's always God, and there's always Satan. God always wants to accomplish certain things in your life. He wants to build you up. He wants to strengthen you. He wants to give you what you need, like we talked last week, to to assault the gates of hell. That's what he wants to do. Satan, he wants to destroy you. Satan is never your friend. He will never, ever do anything good for you. He will never do anything that is not opposed to God. Jesus pulled back the curtain and kind of showed us the the daily spiritual battle that's happening between God and Satan over every single one of us every single day of our lives. When he told Peter what was about to happen to him. This comes in Luke chapter 22. Jesus says to him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times. Simon, Simon. He was the leader of the group. Satan has demanded to have you. He wants to sift you like wheat. Satan wants to sift us like wheat. He wants to shake the wheat out so that the husk is what is held on to and the good kernel that's in there is gone and thrown away. God wants the exact opposite. Those are those two forces that are competing with a vested interest in what's going on in your life. Every time we go through a dark time, every time, Satan is trying to dismantle your faith. Every time you go through a good time, every time, Satan will try to dismantle your faith. You see, one of the things that we need to remember is we go through battles. And and when we know that a battle is coming, we prepare for that battle. But it's often not the battle that we're aware of that we need to be most aware of. It's the battle after the battle. I don't know when most pastors fall in immorality, but I would suspect it's Monday. We know what's coming on Sunday. We're preparing, we're praying, we're getting ready, we're getting ourselves ready. We long for God to speak to us so that he can move through us. And after that battle is done, we're fatigued. And we're susceptible. And if we're not careful and not prepared for the battle after the battle, we could fall. Like all of us. I've been walking through a particularly dark time with a friend lately. During his dark night of the soul... God has reminded us both that God is his king. And even though it would feel good to lash out at those who are attacking him, their godless behavior does not suspend his character as a subject of his king. 
He can trust God to do justly. And that's what he's entrusting the Holy Spirit to enable him to do. I don't know how God's going to use this to refine my friend's character. But I know that the enemy would love to dismantle it. But since Jesus is his king, he understands that even his reputation is the cheese that God can move. That's the thing. People can attack us. They can, they can slander us. They can malign us. They can attack our reputation. But they cannot touch our integrity. We have to give that away. Jesus was a man of no reputation. Think of all the things that were said about him. And he kept walking in his integrity before his God. And that's what he wants us to do. Being part of God's kingdom does not guarantee us a pain-free life, a life of luxury and ease. Since Satan cannot hurt God, he does the next best thing. He comes after his kids. He wants to hurt you. He wants to hurt me. Expect opposition. Be ready for the enemy's guerrilla tactics so that you can stand strong in your faith because Satan loves to play God. Satan loves, if he's given the opportunity, to move our cheese. So knowing Satan's tactics well, in the next verse in 1 Peter 5, Peter says this, Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood around the world. And we can resist, we can suffer and face opposition, which we will have to do all of, with confidence, knowing that our king has reserved our place at his table. Your pardon in his kingdom, your relationship in his family is secure with him. So the next verse in 1 Peter 5 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. This is not a work you and I do. Our work is obedience. Our work is to say, yes, my king, I will do what you say. I will go where you tell me. I will give what you tell me to give. I acknowledge that everything I have, all the cheese in my life, is yours to move as you will. Because my focus is not on cheese, my focus is on my king. And he will take care of the rest. Change is inevitable. Your cheese is going to be moved. Everything this world has to offer is only cheese that will be consumed, lost, stolen, constantly moved. Only the kingdom of God is worth the investment of your life. Make Jesus your king. Kick cheese off the throne of your life. Make your hope in your king and your king alone. Instead of being upset, accept that opposition is real and cheese is mobile. And in those times when your king chooses to move your cheese, scurry into action and sniff out the new cheese he has in mind for you. Trust King Jesus and leave the cheese to the little people. Let's pray together. Father, it is so difficult to take our minds off of the things we really like. I mean, you made this world so incredibly fun. We enjoy our pursuits, and, and I'm grateful that you want us to. But Father, help us to know when, it's, when that cheese is becoming bigger than it should be. When it is displacing you as our king, as our ultimate authority. Father, I pray that, that anyone here who's never put their faith and trust in you and, and acknowledge you 
allowing you, inviting you to be king of their lives, to sit on the throne of their lives, that they would consider that even right now. If that's you right now, I just want to invite you to pray along with me. You don't have to pray out loud, but pray in your heart. Pray a simple prayer, something like this. Use your own words if you like. God, I've got other things on the throne of my life right now. But I'm asking you to take them off. I'm asking you to take the throne of my life. I confess my sinfulness to you. I confess that I've, that I've followed another king and I am, I've been wrong. Please forgive me. Come into my life right now. Take the throne of my life. Take everything. My dreams, my hopes, my stuff, my relationships. It's all yours. Use me as you see fit. And those of us who have already made that decision, if God has prompted, prompted us with things that have scooched onto the throne, let's dedicate ourselves to saying no more. Pray a simple prayer like this with me. God, I've allowed other things to crowd you off the throne. I've, I've allowed my, my, my pleasures, my hobbies, my, my relationships, my whatever. You know what it is to, to crowd you out. Forgive me. Forgive me. Take your rightful place and show me how you want me to live for you each and every day. Jesus, thank you for your love for us, for willingly seeing who we were and dying for us anyway. Father, thank you for the plan that pulled it all together. And Spirit, thank you for the, being the one who comes to work in our lives right now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed either of those prayers, I would love to talk to you about that if you'd like. So in the Connect card that's in your pew, pew in front of you, before the offering comes, take it and write down just the one word, um, want Jesus to be king or something like that, and put your, your name and contact information. I'd love to get with you this week. Now we have a special uh, thing with the ushers are coming forward. Garrett will set up the offering. We've got something special with our kids.